have a little history lesson about Syria, especially. We're going to also have a little look at uh, the origin of Russia. I think all of us can place where Syria is on the map because it's involved in the news so often, but perhaps we don't know much about the backgrounds to Syria. So Syria is a modern-day nation. I've given it its full title. It's the Syrian Arab Republic. Um, uh, and it is a modern-day nation. However, like Israel, it has its origins way back in the past. And its capital is Damascus. And if you just uh, hone up the map a bit, Damascus is to the south end of Syria, and that was its uh, capital for a long time and is the capital today. Now, Damascus, as a name, we find in the early pages of the Bible. Way back in Genesis chapter 14, there is an account of kings coming from the north, from uh, Syria and Iraq and Iran of today, for, uh, four kings gathering together to come down into Canaan, as it was known in those days, uh, to fight against the five kings of Canaan. And for quite a few years, these four kings from the north held sway over the five kings of Canaan, and they paid tribute every year. And then one occasion they decided they were going to rebel, they didn't want to pay tribute, and there was a big battle. And as a result of that battle, the kings of the south in Canaan were defeated by the four kings. And there was great prey, people taken away captivity. Now at this time there was a man, Abram, who later became known as Abraham, who was the father of the Jewish nation. He lived in this area. And though not directly involved, his nephew, Lot, was one of those who was taken away captive. And so Abraham uh, set out in pursuit of the four kings who had taken captive all the possessions of the five kings of Canaan. And we're told that he pursued them up to Dan and then on to a, a city called um, Hobar on the left-hand side of Damascus, as he uh, Genesis chapter 14 tells us. And there he uh, overcame the, uh, and rescued the people who had been taken captive. And actually he returned um, back to Jerusalem. It was known as Salem. Uh, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, came out to meet them with bread and water. But that's a different story. But just to show that Damascus was a known place at that time, at the same time as Jerusalem or Salem existed as a city. In later time, it came under the control, Damascus came under the control of King David and King Solomon. You can see from the map there that his uh, empire extended way north of Damascus. But with the ending of Solomon's reign, the uh, kingdom began to disintegrate and uh, Syria gained its independence, and Damascus was its city. And We read about Syria and Damascus in the scriptures as being one of the enemies of Israel, very often coming and attacking Israel, and uh, it wasn't until the Assyrians came, just about 10, 15 years before the ten tribes were taken into captivity by the Assyrians, that the Assyrians came and besieged Damascus and destroyed it as a city, took its inhabitants uh, away captive, as I say, as it was to do a few years later to the Ten Tribes. And then it, it then came under the control, not only the Assyrians, but the Babylonians, and its capital uh, moved from Damascus. Damascus ceased to be the capital city. But it continued as uh, recovered, uh, as most cities do from their captivities, and it became a trading city. And in the time of Ezekiel, uh, who records the um, nations that did business with Tyre, which was on the sea coast, Tyre was a city which was a, a great merchant city, and many nations came and did their business there. And Damascus uh, traded in the Tyre uh, fairs with a great multitude of wares of thy making, so it was a manufacturing place, uh, a multitude of all riches, so all 
kinds of things, but its speciality was dealing in wine and white wool. So there was Damascus as a, a prospering city. I say in later times, uh, its capital moved to Antioch uh, under the Greek Empire, under the Seleucid Empire. And uh, Antioch features again in the Bible. Uh, this was uh, where Paul uh, set sail from uh, when he went on his missionary journeys. As also Damascus uh, features in the New Testament because it was Saul who became later the Apostle Paul who had his great revelation on his journey to Damascus, where he saw that blinding light and his eyes were opened, that Jesus was indeed alive uh, and uh, was in control of affairs, and he had his great calling. Antioch uh, exists as ruins today. It's actually in part of Syria. When uh, at the end of World War I and this was all divided up, uh, Syria had the, the coloured portion on that map, and Antakya, which is uh, the modern Antioch, the ruins of Antioch lie alongside it, is actually in Syria, in, in uh, Turkey, sorry, rather than in Syria. And Syria would very much like it back, and maybe in all the battles that are taking place at the moment, uh, this area will be taken on Turkey and restored back to Syria, but that's a bit of a lie. So back to history, so after the uh, Greek Empire, the Seleucid Empire, the Romans came along and Syria became like Judea, a province of the Roman Empire. And later on when the Roman Empire was divided into East and West, it became under what was known as the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Empire, it became a province of that. And then subsequently Mohammed comes along, conquers the area, comes under control of Mohammed. Christians come along and have crusades, and Syria becomes uh, part of the uh, Crusade Empire. A very mixed uh, history for the land of Syria, uh, until we come to about the time of 1453, when Constantinople fell to the Ottoman rule, and a few years later, in 1516, it came under control of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire continued to expand. This is a map showing it as its greatest extent, about 150 years after um, Syria came under its control. And then from 1683, the Ottoman Empire slowly shrank. But Syria was always part of it. Uh, and when we come to the beginning of World War I, uh, the Ottoman Empire had shrunk to the yellow portions on the map there, including Syria. And as a result of World War I, with the actions of the British and the Anzac forces and the French, the whole region was uh, freed from the Ottoman rule, and Turkey was pushed back to where Turkey is today. The Ottoman Empire came to an end, and the state of Turkey was established in 1923 after the World War I. And following World War I, Britain and France carved up the area the French had control of uh, Syria, and uh, the British had control of what was to become Jordan and Israel. So it wasn't until 1946 that Syria became independent and became the Arab Republic. 1946, and then two years later, Jordan, uh, no, same year, Jordan became independent. Two years later, Israel became independent. So the pushing back of Turkey enabled the Middle East to come alive, and many of the countries that we think are so old are actually uh, very new. Um, so Syria, to understand what happens in Syria, we have to know a bit about the religious background. The main population of Syria are Sunni Muslims. Um, but uh, that's 74%, 13% are Shia Muslims. And big difference between Shia and Sunni, um, and very opposed to each other. 10% uh, are Christian, and about 3% uh, are Druze. Now, in time past, um, uh, the present ruler, Bashar uh, Assad, has been president since 2000. His father before him was president since 1971. 
And they belong to a, a Shia sect, uh, the Alawa sect. And under their rule, there was comparative stability between the different factions of uh, Muslim rule, uh, as also between the Christians. Under Assad and under his father, the Christians enjoyed uh, a fairly easy existence. They were tolerated. That has all changed in the past few years with the invasion or the the attempt to topple uh, Assad because of his uh, oppression against the Arab Spring when it came in 2011 to Syria. Uh, and there has been great calls for the man to be deposed because of his war crimes. Well, because of opposition to Assad, many other rebel groups, as they're termed, are in Syria. And they are Muslim in the main and are very opposed to Christians and the Christians have had to flee. And very largely the, the immigrants that we see coming into Europe uh, are Christians from this uh, problems in Syria. Uh, great streams, hordes of people have come out of Syria into what they seek to find freedom in Europe. Uh, and really, Brexit was largely the pressure that this immigration from this region into Europe caused pressure upon the British people to say, enough's enough, we can't stand uh, the increase in numbers of migrants into this country uh, and their desire to have secure borders did lead to uh, an element of the vote for Brexit. At the moment, there is uh, comparative peace for Damascus. That seems to have settled down, and most of the warfare is up in the north, as uh, America and Russia are seeking to uh, deal with the ISIS, which you can see the coloured region on the maps there, uh, and their two headquarters, uh, Raqqa and Mosul. And at the moment, there is uh, great battles taking place in those two regions to try and break the power of ISIS in Syria and in Iraq. So that's, that's the background to Syria uh, and gives us a clue as to why Russia is so involved in Syria. But uh, let's just have very briefly, and we did look at this uh, about a year ago, so fairly brief, the origin of Russia lies in Ukraine and the regions north of it goes back 1,100 years, 1,200 years. The Russian Empire had its origin in this Kevian Rus uh, amalgamation of uh, Kiev and area to the north, Novgorod, Novgorod um, coming together, pooling their resources and setting up uh, an empire. And uh, the Soviet writers, this was written obviously before the fall of the Soviet, but... The Soviet historians look on Igor, who was 913, the ruler in 913, as the true beginning of the Russian princely line. So the Russians see this uh, empire that uh, arose back 13, 1100 years ago as the beginnings of the Russian empire. And one of the important rulers was the last one on that list there, Vladimir in 988, who was uh, the one that brought Christianity to this uh, little empire. They were pagan before that time. Uh, he wanted to explore Christianity, uh, had a look at what Rome was teaching, had a look at what the Orthodox Church was teaching in Constantinople, went to Jerusalem to see what the remnant of the Jews who were there, what they were teaching, uh, and decided that the Orthodox religion was the religion for his people and brought back uh, the Greek Orthodox religion to Kiev and the Gorod, uh, and they were baptized into the Orthodox religion. And so that was just over a hundred years ago that the Russian state in its earliest form and became Christianized Orthodox um, uh, Greek Orthodox. 
In later time, that uh, empire began to be dissipated with the Mongol invasions in 1240, which caused the church to move from Kiev, where it was centered, what became the Russian Orthodox Church, was based in Kiev, moved up to Vladimir, and then finally ended up in Moscow in 322. And that became the center for the Russian Empire. This marked out Moscow uh, as the centre of it. And what is interesting to us as Marvel students is to see how in the movement of the um, state religion from Kiev up to Moscow was a, a movement of Rome and what Rome stands for. Originally, Rome was the centre of the Roman world under Constantinople when he made Rome only Christian, uh, he moved his throne to Constantinople, uh, remodeled the city and uh, called it after his name, it was remodeled on Rome, and that was the center of Christianity, the Roman world, uh, for a long period of time. Then in 1453, when Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Empire, then the Russian Orthodox Church absorbed and took on board all that Constantinople stood for, and Moscow was known as the Third Rome. And the symbol of the Byzantine Empire, the double-headed eagle looking east, looking west, was uh, absorbed by the Russians. This is in its uh, most modern um, format. It has changed slightly, but the principle of two uh, eagles uh, has been the symbol of Russia, was the Byzantine symbol, was the Russian, was the uh, Roman symbol, the eagle. So what is of interest to us is that Russia has always been interested in the retaking Constantinople to re-avenge what happened when the Ottoman Emperor came in and smashed the uh, Orthodox Church. And this we shall see plays a key to what Putin does today. He is desiring to take Constantinople as well as Jerusalem, but we shall come to that in a moment. So from about 1240 onwards, uh, Moscow was the centre of Russia. Um, <coughs> and this shows it from about 1151 to about 1965. And then... Uh, in World War I, communism came in, the Great Russian Revolution overthrew the old order, the order of the Tsars, uh, and we had a long period of about 70 years of communism uh, in Russia, and that was broken up in 1991. And subsequently, rulers like Putin have looked to rebuild the empire that Russia used to have, and all these countries in the various colours around uh, all broke away from Russia, but Russia has been doing its best to absorb them back in. He wants to rebuild an, a, a Russia modelled upon the old Tsars uh, and himself uh, modelling himself upon Tsar Peter the Great. So modern day Russia uh, has gone through various stages and uh, at the moment, it is trying to rebuild itself with church and state working together as it did in the past. And um, we believe that this is significant. This is part of the signs of our times. That we're going back to how things were. Uh, and Russia is seeking to build herself up as a strong empire, working with the church to hold together this vast empire that she has. And she's also interested in moving down into the Middle East. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. 
Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by Christadelphianvideo.org. For establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthandProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthandProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section where any Ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own Ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on World News events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time, and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by christadelphianvideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation, so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.